Welcome back everyone to our Sunday School series as we go through the Gospel Project. We are going to be looking at a very famous parable of Jesus today, the prodigal son. And most people who have read or heard the parable of the prodigal son understand that it chronicles the dangers of wild living and God's loving acceptance of repentant sinners. But this parable is much about the older brother as well as it is the younger brother. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, wonderful, precious Lord, our God, thank you, Lord God, for your amazing grace, your wonderful love, your salvation in your Son, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we can study your word, that you reveal in your word your heart, your will, Lord, you revealed your plan, and Lord, help us to learn to grow from it today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We are going to be reading from the book of Luke in chapter, uh, excuse me, chapter 15 today, starting in verse 11. We're going to be reading verses 11 through 13 for this first section. And he, that is Jesus, said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. By asking for his inheritance early, before his father's death, this son was dishonoring and cutting himself off from his father and his family because he desired to live for himself. This is the essence of every sin, both from the prodigal son and from us. The son committed himself to a sinful life, indulging the desires of his flesh. His actions were self-centered. This was self-worship. The son sought only to honor and please himself. In the book of Judges, all of the bloodshed and perversion that we read about there was a result of every person doing whatever seemed right to him. This is otherwise known as moral relativism. In a sense, all sin is a form of moral relativism because we are deciding in that moment that our desires take precedence over God's glory and the needs of others. Any sin is turning from the satisfaction of God to the prospect of satisfying ourselves apart from Him. Sin is living as if we were the lords of our own lives. To live with yourself at the center rather than God is to live spiritually bankrupt and to set yourself up for utter catastrophe and sorrowful emptiness. God must be the sinner. He must be our, our priority. And we continue this story in Luke 15, verses 17 through 24. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. <clears throat> the prodigal son had bottomed out. He is not just at the end of his money, but he had become to the end of himself. 
In coming to Christ, we all must come to this same end. The circumstances will look much different for each of us, but until we despair of ourselves, we will not see the beauty of Christ in the gospel. The younger son humbled himself and went home. He did not go to claim his place as a son, but to work for his father as a hired hand. In his ignorance, he figured that was the only way of being acceptable to his father, as someone working for his living, to pay off his debt. How many people, believers and unbelievers alike, make this same mistake? Seeing our great sin debt to our great and holy God, we automatically assume that we must begin paying it off. Even after learning that salvation is free and freely given to all who believe in Jesus. We are so sorrowful about our debt that we assume the Lord will only bring us on as a hired hand rather than welcome us home as a beloved child. We simply cannot fathom the possibilities of his grace. In his fulfillment of the law, Christ put an end to the idea of earning salvation with religion forever. Grace really is revolutionary. Ephesians 2 verses 8 through 9 say, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. My friends, we cannot earn or buy our way into heaven. We cannot buy our way back into the family. We cannot earn a way into heaven by working and being a hired hand. God accepts us as children because of his love, because of his grace. Isn't that wonderful? That's good news. That's the gospel. And our last section, verses 25 through 32. Remember, there's another son in this story. Let's see his response. Now, his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his, excuse me, but when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you were always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this brother was dead. Excuse me, this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. God is gracious. God's nature is to delight in giving unmerited favor, that is, grace, to those who are undeserving. That's you and me. Because of sin, we deserve death. But God has demonstrated his graciousness by providing atonement and forgiveness for our sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus. That is God's grace and his mercy. Our Heavenly Father's goodness is not contingent upon the law, as if we could earn his favor through our legalistic efforts. Rather, we experience God's goodness through his grace. The older son was seeing it as he had earned it. The younger son thought he had to go back and earn it. But the father said, you're my son. You don't have to earn it. While Jesus was definitely shown, excuse me, while Jesus has definitely shown that sin is destructive, he also shows that the older brother's self-righteousness and pride in his own obedience was just as distancing between himself and his father. The prodigal had repented and enjoyed the celebration. 
the older brother refused to go in and refused to celebrate. Holding a grudge against his younger brother and even more against his father for his grace and goodness towards the younger son. Bearing grudges and unforgiveness in your heart is very damaging, not to the other person, but to you. It's been said that that unforgiveness or holding a grudge is like drinking poison and hoping the other person dies. <laughs> it's just slowly killing you on the inside. Ephesians 4.32 tells us that we need to forgive as the Lord forgave us. Just as this father in the story forgave that wayward son, our Father in heaven forgives us when we come to him in the name of Jesus. And so we also need to forgive others. So if there's anybody that you're holding a grudge against, anybody that you have not forgiven for some offense that they committed, it's time to get that right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, precious Lord of God, thank you so much that you forgave us, that you sent your son Jesus to die for us so that we could have life and have an eternity with you and your kingdom as your sons and daughters. Lord, if there's anyone that we are holding a grudge against or have unforgiveness in our hearts, Lord, forgive us, number one, for that. And Lord, help us. Help us to forgive. Help us to release that grudge into your hands, Lord, and to forgive as you have forgiven us. Thank you, Lord, for your unmerited, undeserving, un earnable love that you have given us freely because of your grace toward us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I'll see you next time.